Hey everybody, today Rado talks through his very first podcast. Oh yeah, here we go folks. Welcome, you have just entered the ground floor of my latest endeavor that I'm going to try to entertain you with over the course of the next year. That's right, Rado Runs Through is starting to do podcasts. Now, what's going on here? How has this happened? Well, first of all, you should probably know who I am. Hi, my name is Rado, and I film a series of board game run-through videos you can find on YouTube at youtube.com slash Rotto. I've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, I've got a few people who enjoy my videos, got a bit of a following, and to continue to do my main show, I do yearly Kickstarter campaigns to raise funds to be able to get new games and all that. My most recent one, I had a stretch goal to do podcasts, and my gosh, people went crazy for it. They pushed and pushed and pushed to get us over the hurdle to get these podcasts going, and so now I find myself here alone in my living room staring at a wall of board games, and I'm going to try to come up with something interesting to entertain you now for this first podcast. I'm going to do it 11 more times once a month for the remainder of the year. Wish me luck, folks. Fingers crossed. Let's see how this goes. All right. Now, I should say right up front, I'm really not planning on trying to reinvent the board game podcast. It seems like there's a fairly standard and well-established format that works very well for several other successful podcasts. So I figure, what the heck, let's not rock the boat. Let's just try to go with the basics. So, for starters, it seems like it's a very, very common opener to talk about what games we've been playing lately. So... What games have Jen, my wife, and I been playing lately? I'm glad you asked. Let's get going. First up, we've got Dead Men Tell No Tales, which is a cooperative game about the fine art of high seas piracy. Finally, a pirate game that's co-op instead of cutthroat. Oh, We really want to play a good pirate game, but it's just they're always about backstabbing and whatnot, which of course is appropriate, but here we get to work together because we're all members of the same pirate crew trying to loot a ship that we have just shot up. Although, there's a bit of a problem because the ship is on fire. It is burning up, and if we don't get over to it, loot all the treasure we want, and get off in time, it's going to explode. So, there's a built-in timer there. But that's just the beginning of our problems because, wouldn't you know, the ship is haunted. It's got tons of skeletons running all over it. So, while we're running around this pirate ship trying to stop the spread of the fire, we are also trying to stop the spread of skeletons, who function very, very similarly to the virus cubes in Pandemic, in that, you know, at the beginning, okay, there's a few of them here and there, it's not that big a deal, but over time, they start to spread and spread and spread, and we have to run around and keep beating them back down, because if too many of them erupt uh, all over the board, we lose. And now, as we're exploring the pirate ship, we're laying tiles and basically creating this kind of maze of rooms that we have to move through and having to deal with the fact that the, the farther we push ourselves, the more tired we get. Instead of hit points, there's this notion of exhaustion. And as our character gets more and more exhausted from fights and sprinting and carrying treasures, the harder it is to be able to move through rooms with a lot of fire. And we need to be able to move through those rooms. We need to get into those rooms to put the fire down because the bigger the fire gets, the more explosions there's going to be. And it's just a crazy, hectic solid game. We really enjoyed our first play, although I was actually kind of surprised. I've read a lot of people online saying that it's a surprisingly challenging co-op game, even when you play on easy, and we played on medium and didn't think it was all that hard at all. We had a pretty easy win, so maybe we made a mistake here or there, so we definitely need to play it again, but our first play was a very fun, entertaining time when Dead Men Tell No Tales. Next up, got New York 1901, which is a game that casts us as entrepreneurs in New York, 1901, trying to build the biggest, most impressive skyscrapers and just, you know, create what ultimately comes the New York skyline. And at the beginning of the game, we are just basically trying to grab parcels of land on Manhattan Island. You know, all the streets are there, Broadway and Wall Street and all of that. And we, every turn, 
there's a display of cards and we grab a card that would let us build in the yellow district or the red district or the green district or whatever. And over time, we're trying to solidify our control over these areas and get a lot of plots of lands that are next to each other because at the beginning, we're building very, very tiny skyscrapers that don't take up much space. But over the course of the game, they get bigger and bigger and more complex. The skyscraper tiles themselves are kind of Tetris shaped, you know, L's and S's and squares and circle or not circles, uh, rectangles and whatnot. So the game has kind of a jigsaw puzzle aspect as we're trying to grab the light, the right plots of land so we can basically build skyscrapers of the sizes and shapes we want. Over the course of the game, we start out making short skyscrapers, bronze ones, but then we evolve to silver and finally gold. And there's a really interesting area control element of the game beyond just grabbing the plots of land because every time you play there are going to be different objectives that are set up randomly where whoever has the most skyscrapers on Wall Street or Broadway or whatever it might be will be able to score bonus points at the end of the game. So not only are you trying to grab the right plots of land that will fit the buildings you want to build but also the right plots of land that are on the more um, prestigious streets because whoever has the most buildings on that street will score a lot of points at the end of the game. But then there's another wrinkle on top of that because when we eventually upgrade and start getting to build silver or gold skyscrapers, the really, really tall ones, th those things get a bit trickier to find. And what we often find ourselves doing is demolishing earlier skyscrapers to make room for these later skyscrapers that can score us even more points. But the problem is if we demolish three bronze buildings that are on Wall Street to replace it with one really nice silver building? Well, we just gave up three buildings for one, and we might not have majority on Wall Street anymore, and that might cost us points at the end of the game. It's actually a really fun, solid game. We very much enjoyed it, although I should say, the first time we played it, we played it twice now, the first time it was just kind of okay. You know, Jen was a little meh on it. And I thought, oh, that's actually really clever. The second time we played, we played the with the advanced rules. There's some advanced variants. And it really opened up. It, it became a lot more interesting. And so I would definitely recommend folks just jump right into the deep end for New York 1901. Fun little tile-laying city building game. Next up is Stockpile, which is a real-world, modern-day stock market simulation that surprisingly works really, really well with two players. And that is a rare beast indeed. That's something that's kind of tough to find. I mean, we've tried, you know, what's it? Buy low, sell high from Iron Canizia. We've, we've tried a few others because Jen has an implicit interest in the subject matter. She handles all our personal investments and whatnot. So, you know, she's always very conservative in real life. So she loves the idea of being able to go hog wild and go crazy with the investments when she's trying to buy low and sell high in board game form. And Stockpile is a really interesting take on it because the main focus of this game is insider trading, insider information. At the beginning of every round, all players get a couple of cards that, that, that will tell them in secret, and only they know, that one particular stock is either going to rise or fall. And so I know it, but you don't. You know something about a different stock, and I don't. And then, as well, there's some public information so we can all see, oh yeah, this tech stock, it's definitely going to tank, so we need to get out of it. So we know this information, then we basically have a hand of stock cards that we start playing to a set of stockpiles, hence the name of the game. These are kind of, I don't know, I guess you'd call them mutual funds or something like that. They're basically collections of stocks that we are going to auction. There's going to be a, a, a bidding auction phase where, okay, I really want to get stockpile number one because I can see that that thing's got two of the steel industry and I have the inside information that the steel industry is definitely going to boom this turn. So I want to grab those steel stocks. And so I, but I try to go slow. I try to, you know, play it low. I, I go low and hopefully nobody else will realize I really want that one really bad. Because when these stockpiles are being created, half of the cards in them are face down and half of them are face up. So you never really know exactly what it is you're bidding on until you win it. And some of the stocks in there can be poison pills as well. So the game is just full of hidden information, you know, bluffing, trying to misdirect and read your opponents. And I mean, it works really surprisingly well. We very much enjoyed it as a two-player game. I, if anything, I would say that the auction itself, it's kind of obvious that it w isn't quite as good as it would be with more players. I mean, I, that could definitely be a little bit better. 
And actually, we're hoping in June to get a chance to play it as a four-player game with David and Angela. They'll be coming over to Malta again until we might get a chance to play with them. And that's definitely high on my list. But even still, as a two-player game, we enjoyed it so much that we definitely think it's a keeper. And that's Stockpile. Okay, moving on to Kraftwagen or Kraftwagen or Automobile, which is... Uh, what craft wagon means in German. It is a game from Matthias Kramer, who is definitely one of Jen's and my absolute favorite designers. In fact, he made my top 10 designers of all time when I did that particular top 10 list. And the thing I love about Matthias Kramer is every one of his games, Glenn Moore, Lancaster, Helvetia, Rococo, where every time he starts working on a new game, he does something completely different. He takes some standard gameplay mechanism, but, you know, really tweaks it and makes it kind of new and fresh and exciting. And so I'm always looking forward to his next game. And I was surprised when I got Kraftwagen or Kraftwagen and started reading the manual that this is the first time he's revisiting a game mechanism he's already used. If you've ever played Glenn Moore, you watched my run through, you know how awesome the player turn order track is in that game, where everybody's kind of on a you know a circular track, and whoever is in last place, whoever's you know at the end of the track, gets to make the next move. And they pick up their marker, they move forward on the track because there's spaces up ahead of everybody that will let you do certain actions. And the farther up the track you go, the, well, the, the more opportunity you give for your opponents to make multiple moves before you get to go again. I mean, this is, a, this is something you've seen in Thebes and Takedo and Shipyard. It's in a lot of games. And like I said, it was in Glenmore as well. But Matthias has revisited the mechanism in this game, which is all about the early days of the German automotive industry, like the first 40 years from you know basically the late 1800s to 1940ish or so. And so you start out as a young fledgling automobile company making effectively, you know, horseless carriages, but by the end of the game you're making you know, really kind of sleek, you know, uh, neat looking cars and over the course of the game you're really focusing on two things there's two halves to your business the retail side where you're trying to make you're trying to upgrade the the engines you develop and the design of your model so that you're, you're at the cutting edge of both of those two and trying to target specific consumer segments who are interested in different things and trying to be the best you know if there's a consumer who's going to be buying that really cares about you know, engines, you know, engine power, you really want to make sure you have the best engines in the industry because whoever has the best will sell to those customers. But those customers came along because we as players advertise to them. So you might advertise to try to get those customers, and then I might try to push my engine so that I can beat you selling to your own customers. And while all of that's going on, there's a whole other half of the game going on where our companies earn prestige by winning Grand Prix races. And so a lot of our research and development goes into making faster and faster race cars. And so you can focus on one or the other, kind of split your 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 interest between the two. But getting back to the, what drives it all is that core Glenmore player track mechanism. And unlike pretty much any other game I've seen that uses this, most of the time in these sorts of games, you know, you're kind of in a situation where there's something up ahead and you want to grab it, but you know if you jump that far ahead, you'll give way too much of a benefit to your opponents. And so you tend to maybe only go a few ahead and hope you'll be able to get the, this one later. The interesting thing about Crosswagon is the way it's designed, the way there is so much going on with the different halves of the main game, at any given time, all the actions you can do are really good and really powerful. But sometimes, depending on your circumstance, they're, they're good, but not good for you right now. And so it might make sense for you to say, well, you know what? Yeah, I'd love to get some more of these actions, but they're not going to be any good for me anyway, so I might as well make the huge jump halfway around the track and grab the thing I really, really want. And by the same token, you might make that huge jump because you can see that for your opponent, all the extra bonus actions they'll get are not very good for them right now because of the circumstance they're in. So we did find ourselves really enjoying it. And quite frankly, I think it might be our, the to date, the most interesting and compelling implementation of this kind of action rondelle that you've seen in so many games because of the variable value of the different actions you can do. All I can say is we enjoyed it a lot. I mean, Matthias Kramer so far has not let us down, and Kraftwagen is no exception. We very much enjoyed it, and so that was Kraftwagen. Moving on, uh, last two games I'm going to talk about that we played recently, just in the last week or so, we got our Kickstarter 
backed copies of Queen Games Parfum, Parfum, or par, I'm not going to pronounce it in French, Perfume, but spelled French style, and Queen's Architect. And one of the games we loved, and in fact, it's probably our favorite game we've played so far of 2015, and the other game, not so much. It was a bit of a dud with us, which was kind of heartbreaking. Let's do the dud first. Parfume. Uh, perfume. Par parfume. Parfum. Uh, yeah. Oh, how it broke my heart. I was so excited for this game. I was ready to back because I wanted to play it right away. As soon as it showed up, we got to the table. This is a game from the same designers as Fresco, which you may remember is one of Jen's and my absolute favorite games. Love Fresco to death. And Perfume is basically, or Parfum, P-A-R-F-U-M, is effectively Fresco the dice game. You know, it uses a lot of the same basic structures and mechanisms like the whole decide turn order by which player is going to get up earliest in the morning. Because whoever gets up earliest gets to go to the market first and gets first dibs on all the stuff that comes out, but has fewer actions to do during the day because they didn't get much sleep. You know, that worked great in Fresco. It's brought over here to Parfume. Instead of trying to collect paints so that we can use them to fulfill, to, to paint certain parts of the Fresco, in this game, we are trying to collect essential essences that we can use to make perfumes that we can then sell to nobles who have particular desires. This noble wants to smell like a strawberry. This noble wants to smell like vanilla. This noble wants to smell like a strawberry mixed with vanilla. And so we're mixing all these essences, these notes they're called, to try to make the perfect perfume to, to sell to the clientele who are always lining up outside our shops. And the thing is, when we go to the market, instead of just guaranteed getting the vanilla that we need to put into a perfume to sell to that guy who's going to give us a lot of money, we get dice that represent our, our, a chance we take at trying to distill vanilla down to the essential notes we need to make a perfume. And different ingredients have different difficulties, but there's a lot, there's ways you can basically re-roll. You, you've got, um, you, you, you can force re-rolls by giving up certain resources. You get a kind of Yahtzee re-roll thing. I mean, all that kind of stuff. The dice rolling works great. Grabbing the right dice, trying to decide, well, should I go for the tough dice? Should I go for the easy dice? You know, I'm prob I can see Jen's already got a good perfume. She's going to sell to that guy before I get a chance to. Should I try to make a completely different type of perfume? Should I try to make a perfume that will really do well with this one person or will do kind of well with these two people, etc., etc.? All that stuff works really great. In fact, as a whole, I think the game is nice. It really does live up to the pedigree of Fresco. The only problem is, as a two-player game, I have no idea why, but they, they introduced this, this two-player variant that, i got to say, I am a, not a fan of at all. I hated it in Penny Press, hated it in Five Tribes, Hate it here. The notion that to, tr to create a, the two-player version of the game, what you do is every round, each player, you, you play it as a four-player game, and each player gets two actions. So it's, you're still only, you know, there's just me and Jen, but she'll get to do two actions, and I'll get to do, uh, do two actions. And maybe we'll do them back-to-back. -back. Maybe I'll do one, she'll do one, I'll do one, she'll do one, whatever. The thing is, no matter how it shakes out, Jen and I, we just could not help but feel as we were playing that, wow. Being able to do double actions every round just felt wrong. It just made the entire balance of the game feel kind of hanky. In the same way that Five Tribes felt weird to us, in the same way that Penny Press just failed to work for us, this method of trying to create two-player gameplay, man, it is just the pits. And I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken to say it kind of spoiled the game for us. I suspect this game would play fantastically with three or four players. And I wish that the designers had used the same, what was it called? Leonardo was the dummy player that players take turn controlling in Fresco. I wish they'd used that same system, which worked beautifully as, as the two-player variant. But instead, they went this different way, and it just, it, uh, it just kind of falls flat. For me and Jen, anyway. But like I said, we didn't enjoy Five Tribes. A lot of people disagreed with us and thought Five Tribes worked well as a two-player game. But we feel it did not. And so we were heartbroken. Fortunately, I've already found a new home for it. Paolo will be getting it, and I know he'll be able to play it with more players, so it's going to a good home, and I hope he enjoys it as much as Jen and I wanted to. Okay, so bad news to good news. The other game we got from Queen is called Queen's Architect, and oh my gosh, it is phenomenal. And gosh, it almost completely defies description. 
imagine, I mean, if, if you've ever seen Zulk in the Mind Calendar, which is the game with all those gears, imagine trying to understand what those gears mean to gameplay without actually seeing them move, without actually seeing how every time you turn those gears and it affects everything, and you know, all these knock-on effects. Queen's Architect is kind of has that same vibe going on. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't have a, a single big gear mechanism on the board, but what you're doing in this game is you are trying to become the Queen's Architect by impressing the Queen by doing a whole bunch of construction projects all throughout the countryside at all these different towns. And so you've got this little caravan and you've got a trusty band of artisans who follow you around, who work for you, and you've got glass blowers and woodworkers and, and masons and blacksmiths and all that stuff. And you're, you're constantly having to hire these people. And you know, they'll work for you for a while, but eventually they'll get burned out and they'll retire. And then you're having to hire new guys to replace them. You know, you're, so you're having to balance your money with how much money do you spend moving around the countryside versus how much do you spend on hiring new people versus how much do you spend on keeping your current people happy so they won't retire. Money is tight. But the interesting thing about this is every one of your workers um, – has multiple stages in their career working for you. The, you know, on this, on the first job they do for you, they might be fantastic and produce five total points of progress towards the project you're trying to do. But then after they've done that, you rotate them. You know, one degree. So, and and you can see ahead of time that hey, yeah, the first job this guy's going to do for me is a six, but then the second job he's going to do for me is a two. But then after I get past that really bad job, he's going to go into a slump. The third job he's going to do for me is going to be a four. So he's going to like you know pull himself up by his bootstraps, and his next job is going to be great. So what do I have him do during this interim job when he's going to be in a slump? And um, can I time my next job so that when he's in a slump, when my, when my blacksmith is in a slump and isn't doing a very good job, my glass blower is going to do a fantastic job because, you know, my glass blower is kind of on a different schedule of highs and lows. And trying to manipulate and time and balance and keep all of your different artisans in sync so they're always capable of doing really good work. Or if they're not capable of doing good work, going to an inn and spending money so they will rest so that instead of rotating them clockwise so they get worse, rotate them counterclockwise so they're rested so they'll get better. It's, it's just an amazing... It, the, the game is so clever. It is a clockwork mechanism of trying to keep all these plates, these artisans, spinning and timing everything just perfectly while you are in a very tense, very tight race with your opponent because the first player to score enough points by doing all these jobs around the countryside can zip back up to the palace, and if they can do one last job, and again, it's the toughest job, so everybody has to be in peak performance, but of course by the time you get there to the end of the game, all your guys are exhausted, and so you really have to plan hard for this. But if you, if you can finish that one job, you win the game, and it's just phenomenal. I mean, Jen and I, we were just loving it. Every, I mean, this is one of those games where throughout the entire first time you play, we we're constantly, oh my god, this is so clever. Wow, look at this, look at what this happened. You know, just blown away. And of all the newly published games so far that we have played in 2015, I think this one is, you know, top of the list. Absolutely adore it. So happy with Queen's Architect. And uh, that's it. So that's uh, some, we've actually played a few more games than that, but that's uh, probably some of the more interesting new titles. Some of these guys I'll be doing run-throughs for in June, some not. As always, folks can go to my request list at http colon slash slash request.rado.com and make sure you thumb any of these games if you really want to see them so they'll move higher in the request list. And now, changing gears, we just finished talking about what we have been playing. Let's talk a little bit about what we really want to play. This section I'm going to call Games of Interest because every month, every day, every week, at all times, I am constantly surfing Board Game Geek. I cannot get enough of that site. I am an addict, totally. And I'm always looking for information about whatever new and exciting games are going to be coming out. I don't know why. I've got enough games as it is, but... Like I said, I'm just obsessed. I always want to know about the newest and greatest. And I actually maintain a geek list on Board Game Geek called Games of Interest, where I actually make note of every game I find about that's going to be coming in the ensuing months or even years, and just write a little bit about what I think. And a lot of people don't know about it, so I figured, what the heck, let's just make this a monthly piece of the podcast as well, giving you guys some advanced information about games you might not have heard about. So I'll just talk about what really caught my interest in the last 30 days or so, starting with 7th 
continent. And now I gotta say right up front, if you go looking for this on Board Game Geek, you're not gonna find it. It's not listed yet. I don't know why, because quite frankly, it looks amazing. This I think is by far the most my most anticipated game period, which is saying something, because previous to this, my most anticipated game was going to be Pandemic Legacy, and that's a pretty big deal. But this has actually eclipsed it. Now, basically, it's, I guess you'd consider it a 4X game. You know, the 4Xs of explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. But it's cooperative. It's cooperative. A two-player cooperative 4X game where, I mean, the exterminate is not directed at each other, but is, you know, basically, well, I guess maybe it's not the nicest thing in the world. I assume that must mean we're exterminating other people. But hey, uh, you know, that, that happens, I suppose. And I just don't want to be exterminating Jen. That's my number one concern about 4X games is what keeps us from playing games, brilliant games like Eclipse and whatnot. So, you know, the idea of a 4X that Jen and I could play cooperatively, that sounds fantastic right off the bat. And I think this is an era of exploration and colonization era game. Although it's not based in the real world at all, I think these are made up countries and whatnot, as far as I know. I mean, to be honest, there's not that much known about it right now, and most of the information that is out there is in French. Although, here's what gets me excited about it. Not only... I mean, heck, 4X cooperative game, that would be enough right there. But put that aside, what's really cool is the world is persistent. You and me, we play for the evening, we explore, we expand, we exploit, we exterminate, we, you know, we lay more tiles and find out and discover more of the world, and the world's getting bigger, and there's more interesting problems to solve and all that. And at the end of the evening, the game actually comes with a with a box storage system that makes it very easy for us to pack up the world and then put it back out on the table at a later session and pick up where we left off. We don't have to throw the world away and start over from scratch every time. We can continue to explore and find even more stuff. And if that wasn't enough, there's also a very strong storytelling component to this game as well. Almost kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure type thing that's going on in parallel to the Cooperative 4X and the fact that you can save your session from turn to turn. My God! This, like, this sounds like it was literally custom designed for me and Jen. It's pretty much everything we want. So I, I gotta tell you, I cannot wait to discover more about Seventh Continent. It is by, although, I mean, who knows when it's coming out, but ooh, I, I just can't wait. It, I'm so stoked for it. All right, so moving on, other games of interest. Well, I did recently discover a little bit about Stefan Feldneck's game, Oracle of Delphi, but, I mean, heck, we know he's going to put out another game, and there's not that much. There's a few pictures of it. Again, it's not on Board Game Geek, so it's kind of hard to find, although if you go to my games of interest geek list, there is, in fact, a link to whatever information there is available for it. So you can see some pictures of it in prototype form. Basically, it is all about exploring the ancient Greek world, you know, bringing glory to the gods and fighting monsters and rolling dice. You do all this as a dice action selection thing. And I gotta tell you, I mean, that doesn't even sound like a Steffenfeld game. Actually, his last game, what was it? Aquasphere. I think I said at the time, it is his most thematic game to date. And you know what I mean that? I mean, I, I, I know some people just dismiss everything Feld does. Oh, it's, com it's the antithesis of theme. There's no theme in a Feld game. And I, I call shenanigans on that. That's just, that's just crazy talk. But, you know, Aquasphere, I mean, I think by far, prior to that would probably be Luna and now Aquasphere. Although this sounds, what's it called, uh, Oracle of Delphi, like his most thematic game to date. So I think that's very, very exciting. And it might actually demonstrate a kind of an evolution to his design process. Maybe he's putting more thought into the theme than he used to. I don't know. Maybe that's, you know, maybe it's still all ancillary. Who can say? But obviously I'm very, very excited about it. And then we've got Solar 3X, which is from the designers of Lagranja. Lagranja? Oh, people have told me so many times I've pronounced this wrong. I keep wanting to say Lagranja, but apparently the J is an H, so it's Lagranja, which is... Uh, you know, anyway, so Lagranja was one of the best games. I think it was our second or maybe third best game of 2014. It was you know from first-time designers, completely knocked it out of the park, amazing game, absolutely fantastic and now they're back, and they're doing a big intergalactic civilization building game. But it's called Solar 3X because they dropped the extermination. They dropped the fourth X entirely. Like, I'm almost as excited about this as I am about um, Seventh Continent because 
3x. That's perfect for us. The explore, the expand, the exploit. That's everything we want to do. In space, could be awesome. And like you said, their last game, their first game, their freshman game, Lagrana was insanely good. Let's see how good their sophomore effort is. Although, unfortunately, this one is apparently not coming out until 2016. Same thing for Oracle Delphi. So it's not really fair of me to be teasing you with this stuff. But still, I'm excited, so you can be excited too. All right, next up, Manhattan Project, Chain Reaction. Manhattan Project is a very, very cool worker placement game. does a lot of really cool twists on the core precepts of what it means to do a worker placement with you know, the way you can occupy other play, players' spaces and stuff like that. Really, really nicely done. Very, very interesting theme. And now they're doing an express version of it that is um, going to be apparently on Kickstarter. Well, I mean, hopefully. I'm not sure about that. I'm hoping it'll be. But... I, you know, we thought the the base game was great. We really love the art style. So a you know a kind of stripped down card game version of that that sounds fantastic. So very very excited about Manhattan Project Chain Reaction, Carson City Horses and Heroes, and a new expansion for Carson City, which is great news. We love Carson City. I already did a run through for the previous expansion that came out, which was pretty nice. Although it had a few problems with two player. And and you know and the way they they introduced the outlaws that made it kind of a little swingy, which I wasn't a hundred percent crazy about, but still on the whole it was a great great addition. And now they're bringing in rodeos and cowboys and stuff like that. So I'm just excited. I'm, I'm sure it's a must have whatever they do with it because you know from Javier George, one of my favorite designers of all time. And I, I, so I cannot wait to see what's new. And also as an aside. I know Kick Carson City has been very, very hard for people to get for quite a while. It's been out of print, even though it's had several print runs. In to coincide with the release of this new expansion, they are also putting out a big box version. So you'll be able to get all Carson Cityed up all at once. So that is exceptionally exciting news as well. I'm very, very happy about that. Let's see, and then continuing on with some more games. Signore. Let's see. This is going to be what's your game's big heavy Euro of the year. And gosh, for the last few years, every year, what's your game has just been knocking it out of the park with Madeira but two years ago and Zanguo last year. And so Signore seems to be their big 2015 heavy Euro game. And I've talked about this in the past. What's your game? They are just on fire. You know, they are making fantastic, elegant, beautifully designed, but incredibly rich heavy Euro simulations. And I'm going to assume this is the next uh, in their line, and they, they've just had nothing but great, great taste. They've, they've chosen very good games to put out, so I have high hopes for this, particularly because it's from the designer of Kingsburg. And it's interesting, Kingsburg was actually kind of a medium weight, almost kind of a light to medium weight. So, considering that what's your game generally does really heavy stuff, I'm really curious to find out where does Signore fit on the, over the overall scale? Is it going to be super heavy? I don't know. At its heart, you know, you are Italian nobles doing the stuff that Italian nobles do in Euros. I mean, which is which is great for me. I know some people don't particularly like that kind of stuff. Jen and me, we really enjoy it. We like playing middle managers in Renaissance times, so we're looking forward to it based on the theme. But I, what's known about it from a gameplay point of view at this point is it is a dice selection game where a big pool of dice is rolled every round, you know, put in the middle of the board, and then players take turns grabbing the dice, and that determines what kind of actions they can do. And you know what? That always works well. That worked great in Panamax. That works great in in Trois. Heck, that even worked great in Agricola the Dice Game. Uh, Agricola Express. I don't know if you ever played that. That was a very, very neat little print-and-play game that we've got a copy of that a friend of ours back in England made for us years ago now. So, I mean, that's just a great, great system from a designer who's made great games from a publisher that has great, great taste. So, that should be very, very neat to see. I'm looking forward to it. But in the meantime, though, in the more immediate future, there is Samara which is actually on Kickstarter right now. I, I, so a big shout out to it. I don't know how much longer. I think it's on for a couple more weeks. It looks fantastic. I'm very, very excited for this one. Actually, the designer said he might send me a prototype, so I'm hoping, hoping a prototype might show up before the Kickstarter campaign ends, but I don't know. We'll see. But it looks very, very cool. It's a worker placement game where you're placing worker placement, your workers on two spots on a calendar. So you might send your guy out say, okay, he's going to work in November, or he's going to work in July, or you know, and, you're, and you're basically, over time, filling up more and more of both your workers and your opponent's workers could all be put up there in November. Now, 
those guys aren't going to do any work until November. And the board is set up, so it's actually two boards. There's the there's the work replacement board, which you know has them all, you know, putting your workers in all these spots from left to right from January to December. And then the other board is where all the jobs are, all these different buildings that can be built. And the two boards slide in parallel alongside each other. So every round, the board slides so that okay, the you know, as you're getting closer and closer to you know working in November or whatever. And so you have this really interesting advanced planning, which is very, very cool. I mean, you know, the closest thing I can think to it is Macau, although you know, Macau is a fairly heavy game, so we don't really play it that often. Um, you know, whereas this, Samara, looks like a super tiny, very, very tiny footprint worker placement game that has that same basic idea of really making smart, advanced planning and then seeing it pay off many, many turns in the future. And I mean, it just looks fantastic. The art looks for nice for it. And again, it's on Kickstarter now. I definitely recommend people go check it out because it looks quite nice. I'd love to do a run-through before it's over, but I don't think that's going to happen, but it looks great. And last one, I just found out about this the other night, Centerville, which is the latest game coming from Chad Jensen, who famously put out Dominant Species and Urban Sprawl. And while Dominant Species was not for us because it was way too mean and cutthroat and aggressive and a little too fiddly for our taste, we really do like Urban Sprawl. And in fact, I've done a run-through for it. And if anything, Centerville kind of looks like Urban Sprawl, the dice game. And I've heard, you know, from people who have playtested it, that it's really fantastic. That it's really, that, you know, Brad, or I'm sorry, Chad, really knocked it out of the park with this. And so I love the notion of, you know, a fast pay, playing, you know, dice chucker building up cities from a designer who is known for making really smart, really heavy complex games. And now he's turning his eye towards dice games. So that's very interesting and attractive to me. So that's it, folks. That, that is my end of May, beginning of June report of games of interest. Next up would be my Q&A section, my questions and answers. But as this is my first podcast, of course, I have no questions to answer. So this is a very short segment, which is good because I've gone on way too long in the other segments. Basically, this is just putting the call out. If you have any questions for me or for Jen, feel free to ask. Send them to questions at rado.com. That's questions at r-a-h-d-o dot com. And I'll take the ones that we can answer uh, if they're fit for public consumption and answer them in my next podcast next month. So that's it for this section. Uh, next month, it'll probably be a little bit longer. Once again, the email address, questions at rado.com. Hey, everybody. I am here with Arig Magakian. Magakian. I was about to say Kardashian, which would be entirely <laughs> inappropriate, I am certain. Uh, I have forgotten how to say Arig's last name at least ten times now. I am so embarrassed. But Arig, I've definitely got that down. Hi, Arig. Say, nice, say hello to nice people who are listening hello. today. Hello. Arig is here today because he was one of my Kickstarter backers at my co-host level. And in fact, actually, Arig, I think you actually backed me last year didn't you? I mean, so you've had this co-host thing in the hopper for quite a while. Yeah, it's either two or three years that I've been backing you. <laughs> well, you're a good man, and I, I appreciate it. Jen appreciates it, and the Beagles appreciate it. So anyway, he's had the opportunity to do a co-host gig with me to talk about you know whatever game I happen to be running through, but there's never really been one that kind of caught his fancy. But last week, he contacted me, just pretty much out of the blue. I have to admit, I'd almost kind of forgotten about him, and said, I've got something I would like to talk about, and proposed it to me, and I thought it sounded fantastic. I thought it would actually be a really interesting topic of conversation, because it was something I personally would like to know more about, and that is that Arig and his business partner, Derek, I think, is that yes. right? Derek, are going to be opening a board game cafe in Berkeley, California. The town I was born in, uh, totally as an aside, that has nothing to do with anything. And he's got a Kickstarter campaign going right now, trying to raise funds to, I think, you know, just get some very stuff, you know, nice furniture and whatnot, that sort of thing. Yeah, to shine the chrome a little bit. <laughs> we got to have chrome in our games. That is definitely the case. And so, I, you know, he, he wanted to talk about it. Maybe draw a few more eyes to the Kickstarter page. And I just want to talk about it because I think it's a really interesting topic of conversation. I've... I have to admit, I'm far too lazy to ever even, you know, entertain the notion for half a second of actually trying to do what he's doing. 
but I do still find it fascinating. I mean, I, it's it's kind of I don't know why I have this weird fantasy about doing it about you know just kind of hanging around all day in my cafe. It's kind of like Central Perk and Friends, and everybody's playing board games, and I'm playing board games, and they love the food, and it's just absolutely awesome. Is is that the dream? Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> we'll see. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it, there's a heck of a lot of work to getting there, right? I mean, what, what all is involved with actually pulling this off? So it's been almost two years in the making. So let me, let me tell you a little bit of the background of the, of the company and how we started. Okay. Uh, I was living and working in Armenia May of last year. I had been there for the last seven years. I used to work for a nonprofit that planted trees throughout the country, and now I'm very happily chopping down trees and creating board games. <laughs> very nice. Uh, so, very nice. So, so you, you, you've done your time. You, you have, have given back to the earth, and now you want your piece, is what you're saying. That's right. All yeah. right. And, and there are board game companies who actually care about the environment, and they make it a part of their company mission. So um, I was looking to do something else, and I jumped online and looked up Bay Area board game cafes. And Victory Point Cafe came up. And my initial thought was, shoot, well, someone beat me to the punch. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I contacted that person. And that person turned out to be my partner later on. Uh, We started talking, threw out a couple of ideas, and then decided to play Um, (laughs) co-op. A few months later, my family and I, we moved back to the U.S. I was born in the U.S. And uh, we started our venture. Derek, uh, my partner... He had been researching board game cafes for, oh boy, a little over a year at that point. So he'd been doing all the heavy lifting. He'd been plugging in the numbers, seeing if it was going to work out, doing all the, uh, the research that one needs to start a board game cafe. So I, I literally came in once almost most of those things were done. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, we started. Um, we started looking at various locations in the Bay Area. We started in the South Bay. Um, the, the barrier, the Bay area is very, very expensive. Oh, it's crazy expensive, uh, right? I mean, it's yeah, like it's, one of the highest cost of real estate in the United States, I think. Yes. I remember reading it's, it's yeah. So you've got your work cut out for you. Definitely. And, and uh, is Berkeley's kind of an outlying borough, right? So it's probably not quite as expensive as, or is it? It is, um, it was less expensive than most of the places that we were looking at. Um, it's still, I, I think if you were to ask most Americans, they would still be uh, shocked at the sticker price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, however, it was affordable in the area, mm-hmm. which is what we were really looking for. Plus, the demographic was just perfect for the cafe. Okay. How so? So, Berkeley is famous for its university. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, we have 25,000 geeks available to us. Um, you know, that culture exists in Berkeley. Berkeley has two board game stores. Oh, um, okay. It also has a fairly decent permanent uh, population, and it's mixed as well. So you have your, your families, your young professionals, different people who also fit in that uh, gaming vibe, or at least have some... Um, level of interaction with board games. So there are there's enough board game interest in Berkeley proper to support two competing board game stores. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, like I said, 25,000 geeks or soon-to-be geeks that you're going to try and convert. I mean, actually, I mean, I'm kind of surprised there wasn't already a cafe there to begin or a board game cafe to begin with. I mean, are you guys the first out of the gate in that area? There must be other cafes in the in the Bay Area somewhere. I mean, you can't be the only dogs in town. There's one opening up in Oakland, which is just neighbors Berkeley. Mm-hmm. As far as other board game cafes in the area, there are bars that have board games. However, it's the sort of like Scrabble, Guess Who type. Um, right, right. You're not gonna you're not gonna find Agricola there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which actually, I mean, I'm surprised. I'm I'm looking at your website right now, VictoryPointCafe.com, which I know you want to point out is just a work in progress. The site will be much better, but you do actually have a list of 500 games on here that you're planning to have in your shop at when you launch later this year, right? And I, this is an incredible list of games. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, there's Arkham Horror 
and a, a few acres of snow and you know, Munchkin and Nations and Suburbia and Stratego and, you know, and Sudoku and, and Life and, I mean, I mean yeah, Get Bit, uh, Glory to Rome. What version of Glory to Rome? Uh, the, uh, the cheapo version. Ah, not the black yeah, box? exactly. Ah, uh, you're not as classy as you thought then. You're going to have to work on that, <laughs> clearly. Although, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you are trying to go for kind of an upscale establishment, because it's not just the games. Uh, I mean, you actually talk about this quite a bit on your Kickstarter page, you know, the, 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 the sourcing you're doing for local food vendors and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's all about the experience in the end. Um, I think most of us have been to board game stores and we've done board game nights there and it's you know you'll usually find some soda and some chips and that's not the vibe that we're necessarily going for uh -huh. uh, what we want to do is is really bring in that high-end cafe experience and then add gaming to it so we'll have uh, sandwiches sweets uh, beer coffee and wine and all of those will be we're going to be pretty dil well very diligent about making sure that every piece on that menu is good mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be there right now you're not doing food prep i mean it's not like you have a full setup kitchen you are working with you know local food providers and and like i said beer and wine providers too is that is that correct that's right right um that may change. Uh, we're in negotiations with the city where we've submitted our building plans and now they've gotten back to us. Uh, so we may get a food prep sink in the space, which allows us now to prepare food on site. Oh, okay. Um, so we don't know yet. It would be nice. Uh, however, we're going down the route where that's we're figuring that we're probably going to have to work with suppliers for uh, our food needs, mm -hmm. which is okay for us because there's so many... Uh, good suppliers in the area that make such great food. Okay, so you said you have permission. I, I'm, I'm still just kind of curious about you know the the ins and outs and logistics of what you have to do. If you want to prepare your own food, you have a, a food sink. Is that what you just called it? Yeah, there's there's these are these are things that uh, I had no idea about obviously yeah. when when I started this business and. Mm -hmm. Uh, we joke about it, my partner and I, that it's literally your, it seems like we're playing two games. We're playing the setup game right now, and then we're actually going to run the cafe much later. Oh, okay, um, yeah, and the yeah, setup yeah. part has taken um, a good eight months. Uh, I moved back in September, and we're planning on opening our doors either July or August. Okay. So there's, there's quite a bit of lead time there. Um, you know, you, you start to become familiar with the the laws of the city, um, the health code requirements, these things which were uh, most people have no idea about, yeah. but they, uh, uh, they're quite extensive. It, it's certainly a decision that, that shouldn't be made on a whim. Right. I mean, you and Derek, I mean, neither of you necessarily, I mean, this is both of your first restaurant cafe type thing. I mean, obviously you were a tree planting guy, which... Is a whole different story right there. I mean, I don't know how one gets a job doing that, because actually that sounds like a pretty cool job too, I have to admit. But, um, I mean, it's like you said, just Derek just had to dive into the deep end of the pool and spend a year just learning the hard way. I mean, there is no Cafes for Dummies book you can just go down and read and, and get all the particulars lined up, I assume. There is, actually. No. Oh, there is? Yeah. Seriously? Did yeah, Derek there, read it? There are plenty of, plenty of books on uh, for cafes and opening a pub and tavern. Um and they give, I mean, the insight there is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we came from very limited experience when we were younger. We worked at, I, mo I worked at a movie theater. Um, so I, I had some experience uh, in concessions with dealing with food, but obviously it's not the same. Sure. Uh, Derek has experience working at Starbucks again, but he was uh, much younger at the time. So we do bring some experience, but it's not the same as, uh, operating your own cafe and having to deal with putting in orders and managing all that stuff and staff. It's its a little bit different. Although, I mean, you have plenty of experience with the game side then, right? I mean, yes. actually, th that 500 games, are those your games? Yours and Derek's? Are you just putting them up? About, I would say about uh, a fifth of that is, is from our personal collection. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of them have come from flea markets, auctions, different things. Wherever we can go, uh, whenever we see a thrift store, we hop in, we go to the game section and see what we can find from there. Uh -huh. uh, just the other day, we picked up a, a choir from there, so oh, nice. you'll never know what you can find. I, I imagine, yeah. And uh, our 
our greatest find was a copula formula day for three dollars from a thrift store a complete copy a complete copy wow very nice yes that's cool are, are you at all worried i mean about mixing board games and food or more to the point board games and beer board games and wine i mean people getting a little tipsy making a few spills i mean yeah the city actually had the same question oh okay um, I, really yeah. So, they specifically so they, want to know how are you taking care of your cardboard. They 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 want to know whether or not people are going to come in and get smashed, and then cause a problem uh, in the neighborhood. Okay. And and what we tell them is that's that's really not the atmosphere we're going be, uh, going for. Um, it's a place where you get together with your friends, you have a, a drink or two, and you socialize and you have a good time. Um, it's it's not a place where you drink copious amounts of alcohol. Uh, okay. And just get wild. So, <laughs> you know, we know, uh, you know, that's what we've told them and that's what we want in the space as well. Yeah. Okay. So, like, what is the experience you get? I mean, if um, the, the next time I'm in Berkeley, which probably isn't going to be for a while, but if I am there and I can swing by, I mean, what do I expect? I mean, how, how does it work? I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about you know, what, what an experience could be like or how we sort of envision things. As, as a group walks in, we'll have them seated. Uh, if they know what they want to play, then go for it. They can jump in and start playing. Uh, we'll have service staff that can recommend some of the lighter fare games um, and can get them started. And then we'll have a game guru. So here's someone who is versed in hundreds of games and can recommend, teach, and then work you through any questions that you may have. Is that person one of your wait staff? So it's it's me, Derek, and then we're going to also hire for that position. Okay, you're going to hire a full-time game teacher. Yes. That is his or her job, you know, yes. eight hours a day, seven days a week, just teaching players how to play games. Yes. That sounds like a very cool job. It is. It's not bad. Um they also get the job of uh, helping curate the library. Uh, they keep an eye out on what the, the new hotness is and what would work really well in the cafe. And then we would also buy those games and add them to our collection. Sure. Does that person have to know how to play off the top of their head all 500 games in your collection? No. Because so, that would be um, amazing. Yeah, it, it really would. Yeah. So we're not, we're not expecting our, our uh, game guru to be able to teach uh, – let's say, uh, Trajan to mm -hmm. a group or anything with a long teach period. Um, that would be insane, and we just can't dedicate that much time to it. Yeah, and well, he'd be um, stuck at that table for 20 minutes, and then he couldn't exactly. service anybody else. Right. So if you can imagine someone teaching Mage Knight to a, to a new group, it just wouldn't work. <laughs> um, but we are expecting them to be able to teach uh, the medium to lightweight fa uh, fare that we will have at the cafe. Okay. Right. And uh, so and he's there primarily kind of like almost as a gateway guru, really. I mean, a, sort of like a game sommelier. <laughs> that sounds very fancy. Well, OK, so that sounds really cool. So when are you on track to actually have your grand opening? So I'm being optimistic and saying July. Uh, my partner, Derek, is saying August. Right. I um, like how when you said I'm being optimistic. Which is code for, I know I'm insane. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, most likely August. So uh, my final question, what has been the toughest thing you guys have had to deal with in this process? I mean, other than, obviously, I, I assume shelling out a lot of your guys' own personal money to get the thing going. Um, you, know, uh, what, what's, you know, what's been the biggest hurdle that makes you say, wow, Boy, that almost stopped us in our tracks. I'm glad we got through it. You know, just as kind of like fair warning to somebody else who's thinking about following in your footsteps. It's just been many. There's, you have to do so many different things. And then you cross one thing off and then another thing happens. That's you're just not, um, you're not aware of or you just, you just don't have the experience. Um, in the beginning, as we were looking for a space, we were working with uh, – agents and then negotiating with the landlord. Now that part is done and we have to move on to uh, the next phase, which is working with an architect and then submitting plans to, for the construction of the, of the space and working with the city. 
uh, and working on those revisions. So again, something that we weren't familiar with and then right. we're, we're currently going through that process. You also have to go through other uh, permits. So beer and wine is obviously a, uh, a permitting process here. Um, if you want to extend hours beyond what's allowed for the space, you have to, again, go through the city. Um, we have to work with our suppliers, so negotiating those contracts. Wow. Um, staffing. There's there's so many things. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, as, becoming an employer, I, you yeah. know, having to deal with payroll taxes, and yeah, it just must never end. The one nice thing is that... Um, so many things have been streamlined at this point. So, for example, we can handle our accounting. We have somebody who, who helps us point us in the right direction, but uh, Derek and I are handling our accounting. We're handling the payroll. Um, there are so many great uh, software and tools available for um, young entrepreneurs. They're not young, but entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, that it makes life a little bit easier. Yeah. A yeah. little bit. So I think I'm going to stop it right there because I got to get back to the rest of my podcast, which is already running crazy long. And um, do you have anything else you want to say in closing? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the inspiration that I've gotten from, from you as well as some oh, of the dear. other. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. We need to cut the mic now. Somebody cut it's, his mic. It's coming. Oh, no. Um, so no, no. I, I started the hobby about four years ago, um, my friend introduced me to Settlers of Catan, and then it sort of snowballed from there. Um, and as I was jumping, I guess, sort of leaping into the hobby, I was checking out various videos and podcasts and this and that. You, uh, Tom Vassell, Rodney Smith, Joel Eddy, Miwi, these are, these are the people that I constantly came to mm -hmm. for uh, advice, inspiration, everything. Uh, when I was Living in Armenia and I was doing the dishes, I would actually have your run-throughs playing right next to the sink as I was washing my dishes. <laughs> um, so really, the, the passion that you guys have been able to pass on through your videos and through the work that you do uh, really caught on. Um, you have quite a few uh, rodlets running around here. <laughs> yes. Um, and... Uh, you know, we, we're very thankful for the work that you do, and uh, um, we're, now we're, we're involved. Well, thank you very much for that. My face is very red. Thank you very much for the kind words. I, 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 I don't deal very well with uh, that sort of thing. So I think I'll end it right there. Thank you very much, Arig, for joining us on my very, very first podcast. I think it was really good to have you because it was pretty much an unbroken wall of just me talking to myself for quite a while. So it was good to have another voice. But now it's, sorry everybody, it's back to me for the rest. Thanks for joining us, Arig. I will talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Don't, I completely forgot to mention, Arig's running his Kickstarter campaign right now. It's got another 20 days or so to go. You can find it by just going to kickstarter.com and then doing a search for Victory Point Cafe. He's got several nice rewards for backing. And if you live in the Bay Area, honestly, there is no reason for you not to back because you basically get your money back. If you back at certain levels, you get basically free passes and free coffee when you visit and all kinds of stuff. So definitely check it out by going to kickstarter.com and searching for Victory Point Cafe. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And now starting my next little section, this is kind of an odd one. I was wondering whether I should do it or not, but you know, I actually in my last section with the games of interest, I kind of started to rant a little bit about the predilection of some folks to dismiss Stefan Feld games as unthematic. Just say, oh, there's no theme here. That theme apparently can only exist in a game if every card you have is dripping with flavor text and you know little story snippets that have absolutely nothing to do with actually creating a world for you to you know engage in and be involved in and and you know have adventures or whatever it might be you know i don't know maybe jen and i just have a or we're just more ready to see the theme where others don't but it is something that i often find myself doing on board game geek having to explain why, uh, you know, 
x functions like y in game z because you know they very often are thematically based and grounded and honestly i find it's a lot easier to teach and learn games if you do it from a thematic point of view and there's nothing worse than watching a video that somebody makes and they only just talk about the core mechanisms and say, well, okay, on your turn, you can draw up to three cards and you pay this resource and then you put them over here or over here. And that means you activate this. And it's like, you're at no point are you actually telling me what the story is here? What is the theme? Why do I do these things? Who am I? What am I trying to achieve? Help me put myself into the world. Like uh, Elysium is a recent game that I've watched many, many videos for. And every time over and over again, I come away, everybody just keeps saying, well, you put your card over here and you're Elysium. I'm like, well, what is an Elysium? I don't even know what that is. Why aren't you te teaching this game to me in thematic terms? And so this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. And so I thought I would actually maybe over these 12 podcast episodes try to give an example about how a game that people consider not to be themed or to, to be themeless. That would be a smarter way to say it. A themeless game. In fact, they're, they can be considered theme if you approach them with the right point of view. And, you know, to maybe allow people to have a little bit more enjoyment out of their game, just to get a little bit something more if they're looking at the game beyond nothing more than just, you know, the raw mechanisms of the game. And so, I figured, you know, there's a lot of games I could talk about here, you know, that have been, I think, unfairly and unduly labeled as unthematic. Pretty much almost everything Stefan Feld has done, or you know, Hawaii. I mean, there's lots and lots of games. But I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the toughest one. I want to make this tough for myself. I want to see if I can convince you folks that Dominion is a thematic game. You know, I figured let's just jump into the deep end, because I'm sure everybody's saying, what? <laughs> come on, there is no theme to Dominion whatsoever. And I would beg to disagree. In fact, you know, there's totally a theme here, and you know it says it right here at the beginning of the, you are a monarch, like your parents before you, a ruler of a small, pleasant kingdom of rivers and evergreens. Unlike your parents, however, you have hopes and dreams. You want a bigger and more pleasant kingdom with more rivers and a wider variety of trees. You want a dominion. You know, right off the bat, that is setting the stage. That is telling a story. That is giving you, the player, the opportunity to put yourself in a different mindset. And now, what is that mindset? How can, you know, the ABCs, you know, how, how do they sum that up? I always love that, um, you know, that, or whatever, you know, always be closing. No, that's not what it is. But, um, you know, the really simple, um, you know, the action phase, then the buying phase and the cleanup phase, the ABC. I just think that's lovely. How can that be considered thematic? Well, here's the way Jen and I play Dominion. Or to be fair, I should say, here's the way Jen and I started playing Dominion. When we first got the game a few years ago, several years ago, I mean, we immediately fell in love with it. And, you know, I mean, obviously it's a really rock solid game. It plays fast, it plays smooth, and, you know, every time you play you get a different combination of cards, so it's always something new and fresh to discover and explore. You know, the deck building just works great. I mean, so that's a given. But, if on a given turn, you know, I happen to draw my hands of cards, I don't, you know, Jen and I, we don't just play the cards out and say, right, I'm playing this, this, this. Okay, I've got to buy three. I'm buying that. Your turn. You know, I mean, that, that's how, that, that, that is so sad. That is such a, 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 a dry, thank you. I was trying to think of a nice way to say it. A dry way to experience that game. Jen and I, I've just, uh, I've got, you know, Jen and I, when we start a turn, we say, well, you know what, for starters, I went down to the village square and I play the card. And, uh, you know, and there was a festival and it followed by a feast. And after all of that, I got so, you know, you know, it, it was such a big, exciting day with all that stuff. I've got a uh, duff gumption that I want to go out and become an adventurer. And, you know, so basically you played a card that lets you play some other cards, and ultimately that lets you buy a really expensive card that you'll be able to use in the future. And now that adventure is in my deck, buying a card and putting it in your deck represents you as a rich noble having access now to new things. I bought my adventurer gear, or, you know, my, my network of contacts, and then in a future turn... When I get to play that adventurer card, you know, it's, it's not just some random card that I'm playing for some game effect. It is the stuff I've done. It, it is continuing the story. And now finally, after many months of preparation, because it took several rounds before I actually got to play that card, I go off on my first adventure. And, you know, that is a way that you can experience and enjoy Dominion that actually tells a story and draws you in. And, you know, just makes it a much more fun, evocative you know, experience. And the thing is, I mean, I don't think people realize this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the basic cards. You know, they all 
they, they are all thematically based. The effects they have make sense based on what they do. A market, which gives you plus one buy, or plus one card, plus one action, plus one buy, and plus one dollar, it does one of everything. Of course that would happen in a market because that's a place where anything can happen. There's so many merchants, so many stalls, so many opportunities to buy and sell. Of course you get to do a little bit of everything. You know, as opposed to the throne room, where it lets you activate a, a card you play, you can do its action a second time. Because that represents a time when you actually went and you sat on your throne and you decreed as a prince or princess of the land that, gosh darn it, this will happen a second time. So you decide to throw your royal weight around. You can play Dominion like that and get caught up in that story. And you know, it just makes the game much more fun and entertaining for me. And it's interesting, almost every single expansion that Dominion has put out, with the exception of Seaside, unfortunately, builds and continues. Actually, wait, I think there's one of the newer ones as well. because you No, no, it is actually Seaside. All the other expansions just integrate thematically in a really beautiful, smooth way. And it's why Seaside is actually you know, kind of our least favorite expansion, because that's the one where if you think of each turn in Dominion, every time you, you get your hand of cards, you play some cards, do some actions, buy a card or two, and that's over. If you think of that as one week in the life of your noble, of your, of your little lord or lady, and you say, well, here's what I did this week. I, you know, I, I basically spent all my time in my cellar because I was worried about witches or whatever it might be. And you, know, you, you tell an interesting, fun story. And all the expansions work with that, except for Seaside, because then you have to start working in, and then I found myself on the Arabian Peninsula, or I was at the bottom of the ocean, or I was fighting pirates. It's like, well, okay, None of that stuff fits, and you know it's always really kind of bugged me that Seaside just you know is a complete flight of fancy that doesn't integrate well from a thematic point of view. And so for that reason, it's it's actually my weakest. Although I, for a lot of people, it is the best or the second best, um, you know, after Prosperity of all the expansions. But we find we enjoy it less because the story is not as rich and full. And um, that is just a really quick little thing. Tell me what you think. Am I insane? I'm sure most of you think I am. And to be honest, I will admit, we've played Dominion now so much, and we know so many of the base cards, that for the most part, we do probably play it in a more regular way. You know, we do just play the village and do the thing and whatnot, because you know, we've played it a lot of times before. And, but the thing is, our experience with Dominion is still built on the foundation of this strong thematic play that we did early on in our experience. So even if we're not actually telling the stories anymore, we're still feeling them. And we are still having a more fun and evocative experience rather than if we were to just completely ignore what the cards are and ignore the story that evolves as you tell your life's tale of this rich noble that you have become. And it's interesting, whenever we get a new expansion, and i got to admit, I'm actually excited about the new expansion coming out, or I guess it has come out now, hasn't it? Uh, although I'm worried because I've got the perfect storage system as it is right now, and the, and the new stuff won't fit. But we'll worry about that when I eventually get it. But we do find that when we do get a new expansion out, we start telling stories again. And that's actually probably the most exciting thing about a new Dominion expansion for us. Not all the cool new card powers that you're going to have access to, but the new cool stories you know, that you're going to be able to tell that are, that are going to just evolve naturally from this very thematic game. And that's it, folks. That is my argument for why Dominion is actually a very thematically grounded game, and you will enjoy it more if you play it such. Now I'm going to talk about filler games, and the reason I'm basically devoting an entire section to this is because last month I did my top 10 filler games video, and I immediately got deluged with questions after it went up of, what about this game? You said you love this game. What about this other game over here, etc., etc.? And I kind of knew that was going to happen. Because, honestly, you know, I've covered a lot of filler games, and we really do love filler games. And some of the filler games I chose in my top ten were very surprising to some people. They wouldn't, I'm not going to spoil it in case you haven't seen my actual top ten. You can still consider this a companion piece. You can watch this, listen to this and then go watch the top ten, or you can already know what the top ten is. And now, what I'm going to be covering here is what didn't make the list and why. And so I'm just going to jump right into it. Filler games that I considered and thought about, but didn't quite make the top ten for a wide variety of reasons. Let's start out with a couple. Cosmic Run and Nations the Dice Game. These are both excellent, excellent fillers. Absolutely love them. And at fact, probably of all the ones I'm about to mention, these were ones that almost made it onto the list. Really, really close. Uh, I was very, very tempted to put them on. 
But the reason I kept both of them off is I honestly just didn't feel it'd be fair to listeners to list them as my top 10 because functionally, neither of these games exist in the wild. Cosmic Run, I have a prototype of it. It hasn't actually been published yet. And Nations the Dice game, I'm one of very few people in the world on people's shelves soon because it's a fantastic game. We absolutely love it. But like I said... And, and both these games, they definitely would have made it on. It's interesting, Cosmic Run would have been Steve Finn's fourth game. Oops, there's a bit of a spoiler. But um, Although actually it might have pushed one of the other ones out now that I think about it. But anyway, since they're not widely available, I figured I should just go on ahead and keep them off the list. So that's why they didn't make it. If I ever revisit a top ten filler list in coming years, I wouldn't be surprised if either of those you know, pushed their way in. Next up, uh, th- a lot of people asked about these, especially uh, the second one, Dominion and Escape Curse of the Temple. There's a reason I kept both of these off, and it has nothing to do with the gameplay. They're both fantastic. Uh, you know, They both make my top 20 games of all time, so you'd think they would definitely make you know, my top 10 fillers, because you know, especially Escape. Escape is a 10-minute game. It's designed that way. You can't play it for more than 10 minutes, because after 10 minutes, you lose in a cooperative sense. And Dominion, I mean, that's an easy game to get done in 20 minutes, particularly if you're playing two-player, and you know the players know what they're doing, and you go quickly. That's an easy one. The reason neither of these made it onto my filler list is because, in spite of their their fun factor and their speed of play, and how much we enjoy them, we don't play them as much because of the setup and put down time. I mean, I remember my my filler definition for us for for the purposes of my list was a game that we can get done in thirty minutes or less, and that includes setup and takedown. You know, getting it all out of the box and arranged incorrectly, and then putting it back in the box and putting it back on the shelf thirty minutes or less. And honestly, a Escape and Dominion can't do it. There is just too much that goes into setup and putting away all the different cards you have to pick, and you know what elements are you going to mix and match together, and what comp- what uh, what queenies are we going to turn on this particular play? It it it. it when we play these games, we, we're not going to play them in a filler way. They're not going to be a thing we're going to just bang out. We're probably going to play them two or three times and try and make a full session out of it because it's such a production to get them out and get them played. So that's why they didn't make it. Moving on to the games that didn't make it because while we like them quite a bit and we would, can definitely see them getting a lot of use in filler-type situations, what's it, Dungeon of Mandem... Council of Verona, Yardmaster and Yardmaster Express, Zuloretto Dice, Goblin's Drool, Fairy's Rule, and Cypher are all much, much better as three-player games. Two-player games, they're... They're, they're okay to good in some cases, but not top ten worthy as, if, you know, if really, strictly speaking, my top ten filler list is a top ten two-player filler list. And none of these games could make it on a top ten fillers for two players. But I think they would all be very good candidates for, you know, filler games with three or four players because they're all fantastic. I mean, gosh, we absolutely love them. Cypher is mind-blowingly good. I mean, but they're all great, great, great stuff. But for the most part, I'll be honest, for several of these, I only keep them on the off chance that we will be in a filler situation where we can play with more than two because we'll probably never play them as two-player games. So anyway, that's why those guys didn't make the list. Next up, oh, Adventure of D. I really thought about putting this on the list. I've done a run-through. I think I've done a run-through for almost every single game I'm about to mention. Not all of them. I haven't done one for Cypher or Dungeon of Mandem. Or Zulareto Dice, for that matter. Wow, okay, there's several I haven't done a run-through for. Adventure to D, I have done a run-through for. And it is so adorable. It is so charming. It is such a lovely, fast-playing um, adventure fantasy race game built entirely out of an incredibly compact deck of cards. Uh, you know, there, there's so much depth and flexibility and fun. It's just a blast. You know, very, very tense, very exciting, but and still very quick. There's a lot of game in a tiny, tiny box there. And I'll be honest, the reason it didn't make the filler list is, oh, I feel so terrible saying it, it's because it's so ugly. Uh, And I apologies to the artist who put the game together, but man, the game is such an eyesore. It is, I'd like to not be this shallow, but it is a deterrent to getting us to play this game. I can think of few games 
that deserve a a you know, an, a reprint that completely updates and you know and revamps and you know it really pulls out all the stops you know a big high quality production reprint of a game very few deserve it more than Adventure D because this game is fantastic and I wish it looked as pretty as all the other games I've got that I can play and that's what keeps us from bringing it out I'm sorry Adventure D I am shallow I am so sorry but you are just so ugly. Anyway, uh, moving on. Oh, Oddball Aeronauts. A lot of people asked about that one. And that's really simple. The reason we usually don't play as a filler is because 99% of its life, it's actually out in the glove box of our car. That game serves a very specific purpose in our gaming needs, which is the game we play while we're waiting for the ferry whenever we have to go over to Malta or you know, when we're, when we're having a – when we have to go – I don't know, fill some paperwork out at a government office, and, well, we know we're going to be stuck there forever. So we carry Oddball Aeronauts with us for that reason because it's such a brilliant, fast-playing filler game that you don't need a table to play. And so while I could have put it on the list of top 10 filler games, really when I was making that list, I was thinking about games that Jen and I play in the house instead of in the car. And so that's why Oddball Aeronauts didn't make it. Draco is a lovely, lovely game, and really, to, to get a full session of it, you really do want to play two games of it back-to-back, -back, where you switch roles, where, okay, first I'll play the dwarves, and then we'll see who wins, the dwarves versus the dragon, and then I'll play the dragon, we'll see, you know, so, and, and at that point, it's not really a filler, but it could be a filler if you're only just going to play one side or the other, and just have a very, very quick tactical skirmish game that works really nicely, very, very enjoyable game, honestly, the reason it doesn't get played more is because as good as it is and as smart as the gameplay is, the, the, you know, it's, it's a hand management card game where you're giving up cards in your hand to be able to do other actions and trying to figure out what the best move is with these two epically asymmetric sides. Three dwarves versus one dragon. You know, Both sides play differently. It's really, really cool. The reason we don't play it more is because it is a very in-your-face conflict heavy game and you know Jen actually doesn't particularly enjoy playing the dwarves because she always feels kind of bad for the dragon and uh, so that's I mean it's I guess it's the theme or you know it's the subject matter it's just a little bit too aggressive for us so we like it a lot but it uh, it just doesn't it, it's 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 rare we're in a filler mood and also a bloodthirsty mood which is what Draco needs Next up, oh, Eaten by Zombies is a lovely, fast-playing, perfect filler deck builder. And unlike Dominion, which takes forever to set up, um, what's it? Eaten by Zombies, you can set up super fast while still having a nice bit of variety every time you play with you know the different cards you're going to be the decks of cards you're going to be able to buy from. And you know it it's, it's definitely fits the bill every step of the way. The reason it didn't make the list is because of the theme. Uh, you know, Jen is not a zombie fan. She refuses to watch wa The Walking Dead with me. I have no problem with zombies at all. I know a lot of people have zombie fatigue. I do not suffer zombie fatigue at all. If it's a good game of zombies, I am there. I, to me, it's saying you're tired of zombies would be like saying you're tired of fantasy or science fiction. I mean, it, it just I I don't get the zombie fatigue, and certainly Jen doesn't have zombie fatigue. She just doesn't like him to begin with. Now, Eaten by Zombies is so good and so smart and so clever that she will put aside her distaste for zombies to play it, but still, it's not going to be, you know, top of the list of things to come out because of the theme, and that's kind of a shame. You know, I mean, it could have had a lot of other uh, scenarios that would have kept the gameplay but would have suited Jen's taste a little bit more, but because of the theme, it doesn't get played as much as it might otherwise. Let's see, and also, um, The Isle of Dr. Necrow and um, Oniram, or Onirim, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Let's go with Oniram. These are both fantastic games, both great fillers, but to be honest, they're both more likely to make my top ten solo list, because nine times out of ten, when those things get, are getting played, it's me playing by myself, because they're, they're really, really great for that. So that's really the main reason they didn't make filler games, because I, in my heart, I think of them predominantly as solo games. You know, I mean, they, they, they can both be played with two, and... and um, What's it? Necro can actually be played with more. But I, I, I just find them both to be really fun, fast, frenetic solo games. And so that's just why they didn't make it. Okay. Now, I'm going to be very, very embarrassed <laughs> when I admit why both Lost Cities and Battle Lines, you know, the Reiner Knizia super duo of awesome filler 
spouse friendly games. I mean, especially Lost Cities, but you know, Lost Cities is the go to game that whenever anybody asks, Hey, I'd really like to convince my games my wife or my girlfriend or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to have this sex as you, but it, it still it just works this way for so many people. It's a great, great game to get your significant other into gaming if you're a dude and your significant other has no interest in games because they're uh, you know, Lost Cities especially is so smooth, so fast, so easy to play, and yet so full of really rich, interesting, deep, tense decisions to make. And then Battleline is basically, you know, Lost Cities on steroids. It just takes the, the, the basic line that we're kind of competing on and, you know, trying to basically have majority on either side of the line and just takes it to 11 with, you know, trying to pursue different types of poker hands and whatnot. They're both fantastic games. And the reason I'm so embarrassed to admit that I did not put them on the list is because they are both games I pretty much lose 100% of the time. I think the only time I have ever won a game of Lost Cities was because halfway through the game I knew I was going to lose again and I just kind of stopped and said, honey, you got to help me here. What am I doing wrong? I mean, Jen just destroys me. She obliterates me so utterly in both of those games. It is so demoralizing that I am just never in a particular hurry to get them out. I am sorry to say, even though they definitely both deserve to be on a top 10 filler list. That's why they're not on mine. Okay, uh, next up. Oh, Hanabi and Town Center I considered but didn't put on the list predominantly because, well, they're both surprisingly heavy games. I know some people might not think that about Hanabi, but you know, for us, you know, Hanabi, it does really put us through the ringer. We really do spend a lot of time, you know, thinking and double thinking and triple thinking. And Town Center is a devious three-dimensional puzzle that you're trying to figure out as you play. And they're both great. They're both definitely fit the bill, but they're for us. Somehow they're just a little bit too heavy. You know, even though you can play them in a really quick time, the fact that they require so much brain power, we're not inclined to bring them out when we're looking for a quick filler because we just know, wow, it's, this is going to be kind of heavy for us to push our way through. And so that's why neither of them made the list. Let's see, where was I? Oh, okay. Oh, um, several games. Uh, let's see, I noted four that all have the potential to make it, and I just didn't put them on because they're all still really new to us, and we really need to play them a bit more before we really kind of commit to them being our total go-tos. And those would be, I've done run-throughs for all of them, Harbor, Patchwork, Isle of Trains, and Temporum. Especially Patchwork. A lot of people ask, well, why didn't Patchwork make your list? And Patchwork is a lovely game about, it's to, it's basically a total abstract, but it's still a very, very neat one of, you know, putting together Tetris pieces, puzzle style to make the, the an ultimate quilt. Harbor is basically a, uh, a super micro version of La Havre, and Isle of Trains is a, is a great little train pickup well not really a pickup and delivery game but a, a train building game with you know with cards and temporum is a very very cool neat time travel game from Donald X Vaccarino, the designer of Dominion. And, I mean, they're all really good. We enjoy them all. I mean, I would happily play any of those right now, but, I mean, I think we need to play them a few more times before we know for sure if they're going to be something that we are always going to that are jonesing to push them into the top ten. Okay, let's see here. Now, these next ones are almost the exact opposite because, if anything, we played them too much and we have kind of got burned out on them. I mentioned this in the video that, you know, it's interesting. When I was thinking about the fillers, for pretty much every other top 10 video I've done, they are kind of permanent. I, I suspect if I were to revisit most of my top 10s, they really wouldn't change that much. But for us, fillers do come and go. They rise and fall. We play them to death, and then we just, okay, wait, I just want to look at it anymore. And while I could have done a top 10 that was based just on some kind of objective metric of what are the best games, I ultimately decided to do what are the ones we enjoy playing the most these days. And so that is why Carcassonne Castle, Fjords, Morels, San Juan, and Roll Through the Ages of the Bronze Age did not make it because we have played all of those games to death. I mean, we just played them so much and we love them. And, you know, I'd still happily play them right now, but it's just they're not kind of go-tos for us anymore. So, I mean, you can almost think they're too good to make the list because we've just over, we played them so much that they didn't make our current top 10 filler list. Okay, now this is a next. These next ones are kind of interesting. These were all very good candidates as well. You know, all very worthy. You know, in their in their own rights. But they didn't make it. And I'm, I'm, uh, specifically, I'm talking about Agricola, all creatures big and small, Pax from designer Burn Eisenstein, the same guy who did Peloponnese, 
Great Harland Hall and Company, and 8-Minute Empire Legends. The thing about all of these games, yes, we could probably play them and get them you know, set up and put away in 30 minutes or less. Pretty confident about that. But the thing is, in spite of that, somehow they didn't feel like fillers to me. They feel like they're bigger, more robust games, and we're not likely to get them out when we're just trying to bang out a really, really quick game. Somehow, I fillers... It's not that they're super heavy games either. I mean, like, you know, like, like I mentioned um, previously, oh, which one was it? Where's my, oh, Town Center is a very, very thinky, hard, challenging puzzle game. And that is a heavy game. It's just too heavy for us when we were thinking about... And, and it's not like San Juan is heavy. It's a, it's a pretty quick, fast filler game. But somehow, the experience doesn't feel fillerish. It feels like a full, big, rich game. And... It's, it's kind of hard to describe, but somehow it just didn't feel right to put those ones on the list, even though we love them all. I mean, and they're they're fantastic. I mean, I, I've done run-throughs for Great Harland Hall and Company, Agricola Big and Small, and PAX is a very, very cool game. I don't think I've really talked about it much. It is a game where players are members of the Spartacus's r- rebellion in ancient Rome. We each run our own separate wing, our own separate group of rebels, trying to you know fight back against you know our Roman over oppressors. And you know it, it's a card game. You're know, playing cards to, to to score points to to basically contribute to the revolution. And whoever contributes the most is you know deemed by Spartacus to be you know the the most worthy hero of the of the slaves' revolt. And the tricky thing about it is. If one player realizes halfway through the game, or heck, even early in the game, that wow, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. I think my opponent is going to do better. You can basically turn traitor and start working for the Romans. And then, if if the Romans actually win, if the rebellion fails, then the person who went traitor wins the game. And it's a really cool game. And like all the other ones, it's... It's got a lot of heft to it. It's 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 a fast game, but it feels like there's so much there. It feels like a rich, robust game. And so it just didn't feel like a filler, like the other ones. Even though we love it so much, it didn't make the top ten. Okay, and then finally, let's see here. Now, there's several that we like. We like these games. They're, they're really, really nice. We very much enjoy them. And they simply didn't make the game because, honestly... In our opinion, while they're good, while they're solid, while we enjoy them and we'd happily play them, they're just not tickling our fancy as much as the 10 we did mention. So I'm talking specifically about Mondo, which is basically a real-time tile-laying puzzle-building game, kind of like a very, very simple version of Galaxy Trucker. Jab, which is a real-time um, boxing game where you're playing cards. Actually, I... Um, well, again, I'm trying not to do spoilers. There is a, a game that w- Jab probably would have made it into the list, but there's another game that kicked it out that's currently in the list. And let's see, Limes is a very, very cool game. Like it a lot, but just not as much as the current top ten. Um, Handler de Caribic, uh, Caribic, which I think has been reprinted. It's It's got a new printing, and it's called Port Royale. So I should call it Port Royale. Very, very neat game. Very clever. We actually do like it, just not enough to make the top ten. Cubist and Blueprint, we like both of them a lot, and they're great fillers, but just not quite top 10 material. They're, both of those are dice rolling games where you're rolling the dice and then using them to actually build 3D structures. They're both very clever. I've done run throughs for both of them, both very neat. Los Incognitos is a very, very neat game um, where you actually get to draw on the board with a, a dry wipe marker, so you can, which is fun in and of itself. We do enjoy it, just doesn't quite get us played as much. 101 is a very, very neat two-player duel. We normally don't like two-player duels, but we do enjoy this one. The programming theme is very, very charming. Takes us back, you know, gives us a lot of nostalgia, and is a very, very cool area control game. That one just barely missed it. That one might have been 11 or 12. And then uh, Derenji, which is a very neat game as well. It's actually, I think, the only game we own... Well, no, that's not true, because now we have... Mysterium as well, but it's it's entirely a a clue-like deduction game that's entirely about cards where players are investigators trying to solve a murder and we're racing to be the first to do it. And it's kind of interesting. It almost kind of feels like Go Fish meets Clue, but with this, you know, solve a murder mystery theme. It's very, very clever, and we actually like it quite a bit. It's, it's very unique. It's like the only one uh, of these games, and normally these kind of games really require more than two to work, but this one works well with two. But one of the reasons it actually didn't make the game is because it's so compact, 
um, we find we actually, while we're playing it, we have to do a lot of note taking. And we literally have to go get post it notes and write down, right, okay, what have we figured out so far? I know this and this and this, and I don't know this and that. And so it's just, there's a little bit, that kind of slows it down. I really wish the game would have come with some kind of components that makes it very, very easy for us to keep track of what we know and what we don't know. I had the same complaint about Tragedy Looper, actually. And so that's what kept Derenji off the list. And then actually, there was one more that's not on the list, only because I've never played it. But man, I really want to try Valley of Kings. That looks so good. Seems so clever. A really interesting take on deck building. And I bet if I have played it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it pushed in the top 10. Just because from what I've seen of it, it seems so cool. But I just haven't gotten a copy of it yet. And that's it, folks. There you go. That was the top 10 filler all almost made it, also rans, and the reasons why. Let me know if you found this interesting, uh, because I think this might be a recurring thing, because I'm going to be doing a top 10 video every month, and I could always follow it up with this companion piece for the games that didn't quite make it. And on that note, if you have any feedback at all about the show, by all means, please let me know. I am easy to find on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Board Game Geek. Just let me know what you think. Although, I just got to say right up front, I apologize profusely for, well, just about everything I have just put you through. If you've actually made it all the way here to the very end, all I can do is salute you and doff my cap. You have unparalleled stamina to have been able to put up with my nonstop yabbering in your ear for however long this has been. My goodness. Also, apologies for the complete and total lack of post-production. Sorry I don't have any jingles or anything like that. Sorry, I don't even have a co-host. Although, thanks again to Eric for jumping in and kind of breaking the rado monotony with a, with a different voice. Oh, a breath of fresh air. But you know what? I think we're going to call it quits here, folks. Like I said, let me know what you think, and I think that's about it. So, thanks for listening. Talk to you later. So long. Oh, bye-bye.